All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Stacey Matrazo. I'm the Executive Director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Florida's Native Bees in Winter. Um, for those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily through the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. Um, this is our old look. This is our newer look. We've had it for a couple of years now, but whether you have the old look or the new, uh, you are supporting um, our work and we appreciate it. The funds that we receive from the sale and renewal of the plate, in addition to donations and memberships, allow us to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing the state wildflower license plate. Um, and if you have the license plate, you are eligible for a free membership with our organization. Just let us know that you have the tag and we'll get you set up in our database. Um, you can visit flawildflowers.org slash support to find out how you can um, become a member or make a donation or get that state wildfire license plate. And please check out our website for other resources on planting and growing wildflowers to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom, uh, about upcoming events and more. We're also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. I have just a couple of housekeeping uh, items to go over. All attendees are muted with your cameras off. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature. You can enter your questions at any point of the presentation, and we will um, get those to our presenter at the end of the presentation as time permits. If your question is not answered, you may email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org, and we will make sure that we get that question on to our presenter. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website in about 24 to 48 hours. Once it is available, you'll receive an email from us with a link to the recording along with the research resource page with links from the webinar. We'll also include our presenter's contact information as well. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Laura Langua Zuro is a community scientist and conservation photographer with a degree in environmental studies and communications from Florida International University. She's a excuse me, she's a passionate advocate for Florida's native bee species and devotes much of her time to promoting the importance of bees. Her photos have been published in several books uh, in the Entomological Society of America World of Insects calendar and in print and internet articles. In 2018, Laura founded the Florida Native Bees Facebook group. And with almost 4,000 members now, it has become a place to connect native bee researchers and taxonomists with novices and those who are looking to deeper, deepen their knowledge about native bees. Laura also created the Florida Native Bees iNaturalist Community Science Project, which automatically pools all native bee observations added to iNaturalist within Florida boundaries and provides a quick and easily accessible means to view the bees that are being observed across the state. Laura can be found most days in her garden or in local natural areas with her camera in hand, documenting bee behavior through observations, photos, and videos to create visual stories that will inspire awareness about native bees. Without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, let me get my screen shared here. All right. Is everything okay? You can hear me and see everything okay? Yeah, looks good. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, so much for inviting me to present. Um, I am always so happy to talk about the native bees that are here in Florida. And I never miss an opportunity. So I'm really honored to have been invited to, to be one of your guest speakers. Um, as you had mentioned, uh, I can, you know, I can be found through iNaturalist. Uh, I've also got an Instagram page, um, Eco Geek Mama. It's my same tag that I use in iNaturalist. And of course, the group Florida Native Bees. And I also have a Florida Native Bees Facebook page page, um, but it doesn't get updated quite as often. So the group is really where 
people are going to interact the most. People will post IDs, you know, questions for IDs, things that they've been seeing in their habitats locally. So that is really the, the best place to find me and to learn more about the bees that are in our um, state. So, you know, as you mentioned, you know, I started this group four years ago as I got more into photographing native bees. I moved to my house seven years ago and there was nothing here, it was just grass. But it was a blessing because I was photographing butterflies and I'd be walking around looking in my yard for butterflies and I kept seeing these mounds of white sand and I thought they were ants until I began to realize that there were green bees um, exiting these mounds of sand. And so that led me to start researching what other bees might be in the area because you know we had honeybees showing up, but of course they're not native to the United States. So um, I started searching for information and there was just literally nothing for Florida at all. We have no books about Florida. We have no you know, real deep information about what's available compared to what some other states have got. And so um, I decided to create this group in a way to try to connect more people together and, and learn myself and then also be able to share the photos that I was taking. And I never ever anticipated that it would grow the way it has. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited that people are learning from it. I try to make it a really friendly community. And, you know, we just, we, we need so much more information about the, the native bees and not just across Florida, but across the entire world. Um, so much emphasis is put on the non-native honeybees, which are an agricultural um, uh, bee. So, you know, we need to have more of our native bees get the attention because they have literally evolved with so many of our native plants. So with that, I'm going to go on here. Oh, and I wanted to just say this front page here, um, this is a Florida pebble bee, which is one of our endemic bees. It is seen across the United States, but we are the only ones who have a red and black species. Everyone else has yellow and black. So it's kind of a one of our cool things that we can call um, our own for Florida. So here, this is just sort of a map of, of the whole entire world, as well as, you know, as, as North America and South America. And I just wanted to highlight that around the world, there are actually more than 20,000 known bee species. And of course, there's some probably that we haven't even found yet. Um, with them, they're on almost every continent except Antarctica. Perhaps that's going to change in the future. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> North America itself is home to about 4,000 species. And then of course, Florida, we have about 300 species, which 29 of those are endemic to our state of Florida, uh, which is a, you know, a pretty cool thing. Um, when you look at the map, you can see that there are dark areas on the map and of course, and there are lighter, but the areas that are really dark, almost black is where there's really heavy species richness of bees. And if you're looking at North America, you see that it's out in the desert areas. And so, you know, bees are nesting in the ground. They love the dry sandy soil, which is why in Florida, we still have a pretty large number of bees. Of course, the further south you get, the more moist the ground becomes and the bee diversity does shift slightly. But, you know, it's really important to understand that, um, you know, where the species richness is, is where it's very dry and arid. So it, it does allow for some very unique uh, bee species in our state as well. So we can't understand about native bees without understanding that they're very diverse. So you got all kinds of shapes. And here we have um, on the left is a Celioxus cuckoo bee. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to add one thing. All my images have got tags on them with species both in the plant and the bee. Um, I do that both so that, you know, we've got that, you can reference it, but also for people who are more visual learners that want to be able to read um, as well as hearing. So I hope that you guys are all going to find that very helpful. Um, okay, so without further ado, here we go. Um, the celioxis bee on the left is a cuckoo bee. So you can see it, it doesn't really look like what most people would think of as a bee. And on the right is one of our, our carpenter bees. Um, this is a male southern carpenter bee sitting on the end of my thumb. Um, they're very big, they're very bulky, they're very scary looking, and they're really just 
big teddy bears, to be honest. They can't sting you. They fly around looking to knock all the other insects away from where the nesting areas are where they're looking for females. So, you know, if you see a carpenter bee, a male flying around and looking very scary, really more than likely he doesn't really want to bother you. He's just looking to protect whatever females are around so that he can have mating um, opportunities. So we also have the sizes can vary considerably. This is the same plant. This is um, Monara punctata spotted bee balm, but very different sized bees on them. On the left, you can see a very tiny dialectus bee hiding underneath the flower petal. But when you contrast that on the right with these two very large Eastern carpenter bees, you begin to understand why we don't really realize how there's so many different species because most people aren't seeing these smaller species. We, you know, we see large bees and we recognize them, but even then we're still so focused on honeybees that sometimes we don't even recognize the other bees. And so here I wanted to just contrast the sizes between um, you know, the, the two different species on, on the same plant. So I hope that that will you know, get people thinking a little bit about how there's these tiny little bees out there. You just see the big ones, but there's little ones and we don't see them. But there's also different colors. Um, this is that same carpenter bee still on my thumb. You can see, I mean, he's, look how gorgeous he is. Look at his colors and those nice floofy chaps on his legs. And, you know, he's just gorgeous, that iridescent color. Um, and you contrast that with the female of his species on the right, who is very iridescent, but nearly black. And there is something called sexual dimorphism within the bee families. And you can get different color variations between males and females, and you can even get different size variations. Um, I have a photo of a that I took one time of a, a Holictus poia, which is a very common bee here, and the male and the male is mating with the female, and the male is about a third of the size of the female. So you know you can get these variations between color, between size. And it leaves you thinking maybe that they're different bees altogether when they're actually not, they're the same species. Um, let's see. We also need to talk about how bees carry pollen because there's very, you know, very much uh, vast diversity there as well. Um, these are bees that carry um, pollen on their scopal hairs, which is on their, on their back legs, which is actually pretty common when you see different bee species. But again, we're gonna see size variation. On the left is a very tiny, and I mean tiny, like gnat size tiny, species called the Perdita bee. Um, she's on a coastal plain aster, which is no bigger than the size of my thumbnail. She's doing a behavior called tripoding, where she's standing up, collecting pollen um, with her front legs, wetting it down with her tongue and then packing it to her back legs. And this is a, a behavior that's very particular to that particular species. But if you come across coastal plain aster or something with a very, um, coastal plain aster and also uh, silk grass, which is another one that they like to use, if you slow down and just observe for a few minutes, you might see what you think are gnats flying around. And if you really slow down and don't move around and observe, you might be able to see some of these bees while they're actually working on the flowers. Um, but contrast that now with slightly larger bee, the very common Halictus poei. She's collecting pollen from uh, a snow square stem or Melanthera nivea plant, which is a plant that will go throughout the winter. Um, in my yard in um, South Brevard, it'll bloom all winter long. Now, of course, throughout the state, we all have different yards, we have different soil types, we have um, you know, different plants. So what we see in my area, you could see in your area or you might not see in your area. And even there are bees that might use the same plant in my yard and then totally ignore it in someone else's yard. So we still have all this diversity in the way their behaviors are as well. Um, so if we move on, we can see there is another family of bees called Megachylidae. These bees don't carry their pollen on their legs they carry on the bottoms of their abdomens. Um, and the, there's, so there's little scopal hairs all over the bottom of the abdomen and they'll collect the pollen there. But you 
also sometimes see them surfing from flower to flower and literally they're landing, bouncing on the flower, get the pollen and they keep right on moving. Um, and so I, it literally is like watching them surf flowers. It's, it's pretty cool to watch. Um, the one on the left, the, the megakali there is actually visiting uh, yellow necklace pod, very um, popular plant in my uh, garden. This is the Safara tomentosa truncata, which is the native one. There is a non-native one, which has a very fuzzy leaf. Um, if you can find the native one, that's obviously the one that's preferred to be using in your gardens. Bumblebees love it. These megakylae love it. I have calistomoides that love it. So it's a very, very popular plant and it's really beautiful in the environment too. Um, on the right is a different type of uh, megakylidae. This is the uh, Horides levite, um, much smaller bee. If you're familiar with oak leaf fleabane, which blooms in the early spring here, you know that's not a very big flower. So she's a small bee. She's not tiny, but she's small for sure. Um, and this, you know, oak leaf fleabane is already getting ready to start blooming in my yard. It's it's kind of a little early, but usually by you know late December, early January, it will start blooming. And it's a plant that blooms across a big chunk of the state, but people tend to mow it down. And if you can leave plants like that in your yard, you know, even if you just leave a little corner, um, you're going to be doing such a huge service for the local pollinators and the local bees. Um, it's just like really, it, it, you don't have to do anything. It's just going to pop up. It's going to bloom. And when it's all done, it's going to slowly disappear until the next season. So I really encourage people to reconsider just mowing all their wildflowers down. I would think lots of people here may not be doing that already, but for other people who still do, um, it's something you can definitely, you know, really think carefully about maybe leaving those patches in your garden that are unmowed, even just a temporary for a month or so to feed these early, you know, late winter, early spring bees. So we can move on now to bumblebees. So bumblebees are a member of the uh, Apidae family, which is the same family that honeybees are in. They, just like honeybees, carry their pollen in corbiculae um, or pollen baskets on their back legs. Um, there is variation in size and, and what they like to um, go to to forage on. But here on the left, you can see this is one of our more common bumblebees, but they are disappearing. Uh, the American bumblebee or Bombus pensivanicus. She is collecting pollen from a giant purple thistle. Um, and I know people, some people don't like thistles because of the thorniness, but they are a huge um, uh, pollinator attractor. And so if you have them in your yard, maybe you can leave them in some little places as well. But if you ever see thistles, especially the giant thistles out in the environment, look for the bumblebees on them. On the right is a, this is a common Eastern bumblebee. This is Bombus impatiens, who is collecting pollen from a partridge pea. Partridge pea, another great plant. It's, you know, it may die back during the winter for a short time, but it definitely is on the shoulder of the late fall, early winter, and then late winter, early spring plants. Um, they, the bumblebees love it. They buzz pollinate or sonicate on these plants to knock the pollen off. And it's, it, you know, if you walk through a patch of partridge pea, all you can hear is bumblebees buzzing everywhere. So if you have the opportunity to have it in your garden, it can be, you know, a little aggressive at times when it, it you know, it, it produces a lot of seeds, but it's very popular among bumblebees, which are disappearing, and among some of the other bees, as well as um, wasps and butterflies. So it's kind of an all around great plant to have in the garden. And again, South Florida, this will bloom in the, the winter months when it's not blooming in more northerly areas. Um, so great plant to have in there. Bumblebees love it, highly recommend. There's another type of bee um, that carries their pollen tucked under their back legs. Uh, one example of that would be Andrina bees. These are really beautiful small bees. Uh, this particular bee comes out in my area in the late fall to uh, early winter. This one here is um, foraging on narrow leaf silk grass or Pediopsis graminifolia. They um, seem to really prefer this plant locally, but 
you know, there are other Andrina bees in other areas that come out in the spring months. So they need forage in those late winter, early spring months as well, which I will talk about some of the other plants you can have uh, a little later on. But this is definitely one of our, um, one of our really beautiful local bees. So we also have a different type of pollen carrying. Um, this is a Hylaeus bee. They don't carry any pollen on their body. That pollen you see like on the, the far right photo, that pollen, you know, you see pollen all over the bee's antenna, on their leg, little bits and pieces on their body, but it's not collecting it to carry on its legs. It's actually collecting it and it'll take it internally into what's called the crop and it carries it back to its nest in the crop. So, you know, these are, these are very tiny bees. Um, and so, if, you know, if you happen to get lucky enough to see them, you won't see the pollen on their legs, whether it's a female, you know, even when you see it there, you won't see that, that pollen. Um, on the left side is a behavior called concentrating nectar. This one, it's not, an, it's not a native species, so I'm not gonna mention what it is, but I was lucky enough to find this little Hylaeus concentrating nectar basically um, going through the water and extracting all of the sugar. So they make these bubbles that, you know, they sit there and they, they pull out all the sugars from the bubble. And sometimes you can find the uh, uh, Holictus poei bees or Holictus bees doing this in goldenrod. You'll see them just sitting underneath the flower. You can watch the mandibles will be moving, the tongue is moving, and you start to see these little liquidy bubbles coming out. And that's concentrating nectar. This is a behavior that they do um, to help with their feeding. So the next time you see a patch of goldenrod and you see lots of bees on it, keep your eye out for a bee that might be sitting still and you might be able to see this behavior. Now there's also bees that don't need to collect pollen. They are called kleptoparasitic or cuckoo bees. Um, they don't create their own nests. They have no need to collect pollen for those nests. They have host bees and they, you know, they are bees, but they have evolved to not need to do their own work. They rely on host bee species to do all the work of creating the nests and then provisioning the nests and then what will happen is they will find a nest and hang around, um, wait for the bee to leave the nest and they'll slip in, leave their egg behind one of the bee's eggs. And then eventually that, um, that bee will emerge and consume the pollen ball and emerge out of the nest on their own. Um, if you're watching in your garden, you may see sometimes what looks to be small wasps flying around very low or sitting. If you are lucky enough to find a nest, you might see them sitting on a leaf or a twig nearby the nest with so much patience that you think, you know, what is going on here? And it could very well be one of the kleptoparasitic bees. This one on the left was a nomada bee that was exiting an agapostomin nest that I found in my garden. Um, you know, it spent quite a bit of time flying around, flying around, and then finally found this nest. And I was lucky enough to catch her going in and then uh, when she was exiting as well. On the right is one of our Florida longhorn cuckoo bees, the Triebulus rupithorax. She's exiting a Melisotis nest. And look at all that pollen on the back of her abdomen. I want to talk about showing that you've been in robbing the nest. Um, so she was one of several cuckoo bees that were hanging around this poor Melisotis female's nest. There was uh, another Tribeolus as well as a Celioxus bee. And one of them was there for probably 30 minutes, it just would keep moving and sit in a new spot, watch the nest, move to a new spot, watch the nest. And then eventually when the bee did leave, um, all three of them, entered the nest at different points. And so this poor Melisotis nest probably became a, a cuckoo bee nest, uh, but they may have even been, you know, when they emerge, they may kill each other as well. There's always that possibility, but having cuckoo bees in your landscape is not a bad thing. It's showing that you have active bee species. You have a, a functioning bee ecosystem, I like to call it, where you have both predator and you have your bees. Um, so if you see cuckoo bees, 
don't feel like maybe there's something bad happening, you know, they're killing off the bees. This is really important. This is part of the natural ecological cycle within the bee species. So I want to show you a couple of other images though. So these are, um, these are all also cuckoo bees. There's lots of other species, but these are some of the ones that I've been able to see in my yard. On the left is a trio of fervid nomad bees or nomada fervida. They're on one of my partridge pea flowers. I was lucky enough to find them. I was just sitting there. I happened to turn around and there were these three bees. On the bottom is your female and you can tell she's the female. You can, if you look at the front of her face, it's dark. But if you look at the two bees above her, they have what's called a clypeus on the front. It's a little plate on the front and you see they're both yellow. Um, that's a very easy indicator. That first um, carpenter bee also had a white clypeus on his face. So it doesn't always accurately describe that you have a male, but sometimes you can do a quick ID and realize that you've got a male just by looking at their face plates. So here, you know, she's on the bottom. The second male is attempting to mate with her. And the third male is attempting to pull the second male off so that he can have the opportunity to mate with her. And, you know, there's all kinds of mating that happens within the, you know, the bee world. You've got bee balls that happen in some places where you've got a female and multiple bees end up in this ball, just tussling over, trying to have the opportunity to mate with her. Um, and as I said before, you know, you have sexual dimorphism where you can have a very tiny male bee and a very large female bee. There's all kinds of different things happening within the bee world. Um, so, you know, this was just one example I wanted to show, but they're all cuckoo bees, very wasp-like. And I don't have an image to show you. I, I, I didn't think to put it, but on the backs of this particular bee, and there's a few other species that have this too, they have what looks like a smiley face. They have two, you know, little eyes and the typical mouth for the smiley face. And I always think to myself, here's this smiley face as they're sneaking into somebody's burrow to leave their egg to eventually take over, you know, that pollen, that pollen ball. Um, so anyway, just I thought I'd just share that with you. Uh, in the middle is a Stila uh, Louisia on Snow Square stem again. Our bees, red and black again, go to some other areas of the country, they're yellow and black. So even within the Stilus Louisia, our color here is different. So I think that's a kind of a fascinating thing. Once again, Florida is kind of unique. Um, on the far right is another type of, of uh, cuckoo bee. This one is a spicotes, um, also called blood bees because they're you know, very red. This is a male, the females, I've seen females in my garden that are brilliant red and really truly like the color of blood. They're, they're beautiful. Um, this one is, is watching, waiting, looking for females to come through the garden. And he's just hanging out on uh, beech tea, which is croton punctatus, which is a nice um, plant to have in the garden as well for some of the native bees. We move up, oops, actually, let me go back for a second. I wanted to, I did mention about the no scopal hair and you do see, I'm sure that most, most people, unless they know bees are gonna look here and not ever think that they're looking at bees because they look like wasps. So moving on to our nesting habits, there's a variety of different nesting habits that native bees exhibit. However, Overall, and this is worldwide, not just in Florida or North America, there's around 70% of bees actually nest in the ground. And out of those, they figure about 80% are solitary nesting bees. Um, so when people talk about, you know, you mentioned, oh, I've got a bee nest in my ground and people, oh, you've got a nest of yellow jackets. And, you know, I'm always telling people, you know, yellow jackets, large entry, lots of wasps flying in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, with solitary ground nesting bees, you're not going to see that. And most of the bees are very docile. They don't have, they're not, you know, trying to protect a big nest. Um, you can come along, find them. They're not going to try to hurt you. You know, it's a little different with bumblebees. They're a little more protective. But for the most part, most of the solitary on ground nesting bees are fairly um, gentle. So on the left here, this is the Melisotis bee that all the cuckoo bees were entering her nest. I would not have actually found her nest except the fact that I was following the cuckoo bees. 
Um, so I'm always on the lookout for bee behaviors in my yard. Spend a lot of time just observing and seeing what kind of odd things are happening. And, you know, there is a little bit of mulch here, but overall very, very light. I don't like to use a lot of mulch because it prevents the bees from entering and exiting uh, nests. So, you know, she found a little patch in here and, and created her nest. And then she had to give up part of it for the cuckoo bees, unfortunately. Um, but wanted to give you that example. On the right is a very common bee across Florida, Agapostum. And this particular one is an Agapostum in Splendens. Um, she's exiting her nest, which has been built in the sandy area. I'm gonna show a bunch of examples to help you guys try to be able to find bee nests on your own in your garden. So hopefully that's, that's gonna give you visual cues of what to be looking for. So here we have more ground nesting bees. Um, Holictidae or the sweat bee family, which is Holictus is in that, which is the one on the left here and also that Agapostomum bee just before they're in that family. They do have different nesting behaviors. You know, a lot of them are solitary, but you can get some communal, like this uh, Holictus poe on the left is actually getting ready to enter into her nest. And look at all that pollen on her. You think she's been out working hard? So she's gonna go into the nest now, but what you don't really see is there's another bee inside the nest with its head just below the surface. It's waiting for her to come in. It's gonna move out of the way. She's gonna enter. She's gonna go down into her brood cell and then another bee will eventually leave. Um, they're almost always have one, uh, one of the bees guarding the entrance there. And I kind of liken it to like thinking about like an apartment building. You have one main entrance, but then you, know, you have all these little apartments off to the sides that you enter on your own. And this bee could actually be living in a family unit with mothers and daughters. Um, you know, there's so much information that people are still learning about the solitary bees within like the Holictidae family that, you know, we don't always know. And I'm certainly not an expert, but I just go by the behavior of the things that I'm able to see and observe. And so I would love to look down inside her nest. I think that would be just an amazing sight to see what's actually happening below the surface. And there's all these things happening in our gardens and in, you know, in preserves and other places always beneath our feet, things that we don't even realize um, until we start observing. So on the right is an aggregation of Agapostum and Splendens, again, the green bee from the previous slide. And you can see the mounds everywhere. It's one of the lucky things we have with sugar sand here is that, you know, here's this kind of green patch with some leaves and things like that, but you cannot miss the mounds. Um, and in other areas of the state, you might find a Colette's aggregation. You know, it's a little bit different, but you'll still see these mounds of, um, of dirt or sand coming up out of the ground. And, and that mound at the top is called a tumulus. And over time, people walk on them, you know, water washes them away, and you just end up with like a flat surface, which would look more like this here on the left image. Um, you know, it's, it's slowly beginning to wash away. So you just have like this perfect hole that looks like the size of a eraser head. And, you know, people ask me, well, how do I know it's not an ant nest? And sometimes they do look a little like a bee nest, but they turn out to be an ant nest. But again, power of observation, you keep an eye. If it's an ant nest, there's going to be activity coming in and out of it. If it's a bee nest, there won't be necessarily always. Um, as much activity. If it's like an agapostum, she's going to go out, she has to forage, she has to bring it back, go in, provision the nest, go back out. So there's a time gap in between all of these things. Um, so if, you know, if you're seeing these holes in your garden, just check, you know, see if there's ants coming out. It could even be a solitary wasp who's working on her own little nest and, you know, provisioning it and then closing it up and leaving. But, you know, look for those like perfect little size holes and look um, you know, for cuckoo bees flying around, all the different cues you can get when you're you know, in an area, especially in your gardens. But these Agapostum and Splendens often start emerging late fall. They're out, um, males are surviving through the winter quite, um, quite often, at least here. And then um, early spring, you'll get them. And sometimes they'll have another uh, brood come out in the summertime. 
Um, so that sugar sand is an easy way to begin finding, uh, looking for nests. So if we move on here, we can see now contrasting that on the left, Holyptus poei, the same bee as the bee previous slides that had all the yellow pollen on her. This is one waiting for a bee to come back to the nest so that she can then leave or allow another bee to exit. Um, when I find them in my garden here, I don't see so much the white sand. I usually find a mound of just dirt, maybe a little sand mixed in. But what I do see the difference between like the Agapostum and Splendens previous, the Agapostum is just doing, you know, she's going to provision her nest, she's going to seal it up, maybe go and, pre you know, prepare a new nest somewhere else. With a Holictus nest like this, I have one nest right now that's been going for two months and the bees just keep working. It hasn't gone away. And I've been very careful not to disturb them because I, you know, I don't want to bother the nest. I, I've, I've stepped on nests in the past. I stepped on one last month. I didn't see it underneath the grass in my walkway. And I watched, the only reason I, I realized it is because all these little holictus bees started coming back and they were flying around trying to figure out where their nest entrance was. And they were all digging around. And finally, one very enterprising bee was the one who figured out where the entrance was buried underneath and she had to dig it back out. And then, you know, everyone was happy again. Um, but I've seen agapostomins have to go back and dig out their nest again. So I try really hard. I, I don't want to disturb them. I feel terrible disturbing them. So um, it's, you know, the more you see them in your, in your yard, the more you can maybe choose to go around them. So, you know, we are talking about winter bees here, um, you know, but winter and summer, spring, fall, they all sort of collect together or connect together when we start talking about creating habitat. The main difference is, is a lot of people are gardening in the winter getting ready for spring or in, you know, in the late winter, early spring, they're gardening, they're planting a lot. Um, so you can, you know, maybe when you're gardening, keep your eye out for nests, see if you can maybe avoid disturbing them leave some patches of bare soil so that the bees can nest. Again, you know, we're not bees. We can't really tell them where they should go. They want to choose the places for themselves. But the more opportunities we give them to have areas that they can nest in, the better it is. And they need to be able to emerge from their nests as well, not just to create new nests. So, you know, avoiding heavy layers of mulch. You know, if you layer three inches of pine bark, um, you know, or heavy chips, they won't be able to get out of the ground so easily. And they're not gonna certainly choose those areas to create a nest. Um, you can go with like very light applications of um, maybe pine bark, but very, very light, almost like where I had the Melisotis be where, you know, there was a little bit, but there wasn't a lot. And I do realize that, you know, it's, it's we wanna have some help for our plants, but there's this combination of how much do we do for the plants versus also how much do we do for our native pollinators is, you know, it has to come to a happy medium. Um, you could also use pine straw. Pine straw is very easy for them to move through. They can access the ground. Um, they can emerge out of, of last year's nests. Um, so that is another possibility. Um, avoiding the use of plastic weed barriers is really important. They can't, insects can't get through either way. Weeds will eventually will get through, but the insects cannot and, and, you know, bees cannot get through there. So, you know, if you can avoid using that, it's always a, a plus. And a lot of people do solarizing where you lay down, you know, layers of um, cardboard to try to kill off the grass. Just, you know, same thing. It comes back to the first point. Even if you're solarizing, that means bees cannot emerge until that cardboard breaks down, you know, a year later or however long later, nobody's going in or out of the ground. So leaving some patches of soil would be a perfect example of, you know, if you're solarizing, try to leave some, some spaces where the bees can get in and out. Uh, okay, so I wanted to mention on the right here, a lot of the megachile species are cavity nesting bees. However, this one is was one of the ground nesting bees and it's hard to see in the image, but she was working on her nest and she's using her mandibles to grab chunks of sand and remove them. And then she would go a little distance and drop it into a pile, come back, dig some more, carry it away. So 
they're very enterprising, these bees, all these different ways that they're able to, um, you know, be in the environment. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool. So I can't not talk about bumblebees because they are disappearing. You know, there's major habitat loss for bumblebees. Um, it's affecting them so heavily. And so they're in the family Avidae, like I mentioned before, which is the same as honeybees. They are, um, they nest in colonies between 50 to 100, uh, 500 is the average amounts, depending upon what part of the country you're in, what species of bee, uh, bumblebee it is. Um, but they are not like honeybees. They do not produce a colony that keeps going and going and going. They are annual nesters. So at the end of every year, the whole bumblebee colony dies out, except for new queens called gynes, which will emerge. Uh, the, the female queen will lay these eggs and they will emerge as, as new queens for future nests. They will leave the nest. They will go um, start foraging, um, mate, hopefully mate, and um, be ready for next year's uh, nest. And then eventually, once they've built up enough fat stores, then they're going to go and start looking for a place to hibernate. Those hibernation spots can be under the soil in your garden, under leaf litter that hopefully people are leaving in their gardens. Um, they need places to hibernate. And, you know, during uh, gardening, sometimes we can maybe uncover a queen bumblebee. And if you do that, you can just very gently cover her back up. But, you know, if, if we weed whack, or not weed whack, if we mulch all our leaves, if we remove all the leaves from the environment, not only are we potentially losing new bumblebees for the following year, but I mean, even moth larvae that are underneath the leaves, it's really important. So I know a lot of people want to get rid of the leaves and take them away and send them away, but that leaf litter is such important habitat and particularly for bumblebee queens. Um, they do nest in, you know, they like to, to find nests in old rodent burrows, um, bird nests sometimes. They will nest sometimes under a bunch, like a, one of the, the native bunch grasses. And they will even nest in underneath furniture or, on, you know, in, in, I've seen people talk about they've had them in their hot tubs, like on the edges um, and underneath furniture, like cushions. This image is a bumblebee nest that one of the um, one of our, our group members, Jennifer Rogers up in Wakula Gardens, Florida, she was in her back lot behind her house cleaning up and people, I guess, had left, you know, trash and things like that. And she moved these cushions that were on the ground and lo and behold, there was a bumblebee nest right underneath it. So she gently, you know, took some photos and covered it back up so they could stay there and, and keep going. But here they were, they found a place underneath a cushion. And I've seen people talk about them being out in the cow pastures underneath cow patties. Um, so, you know, but them losing so much habitat with all the habitat destruction happening, whatever we can do to help them is a huge benefit for bumblebees. Um, one of these days, I hope to be able to proudly say that I have a bumblebee nest in my yard, but I have not been able to have that yet. But I'm hoping because they do come here to eat. All right, so then now let's talk about stem nesting bees. Um, so cavity and stem nesting bees are kind of in the same 30% um, boat of, you know, how many plants are, or how many uh, bees are nesting that way. Um, but I'm going to start with the stem nesting bees, not quite as many of them. Um, Again, we have that Heriades levati, um, which is the late winter, early spring um, foraging bee. She's on oak leaf fleabane again, that wonderful plant you want to leave out in your garden in the springtime. In the middle is one of our tiniest carpenter bees. This is a uh, Ceratina floridana. We have several um, Ceratina bees across the state. This is the one that I see most often locally. And she is on a uh, frog fruit plant, which is a great ground cover for your um, yards, especially if you have a very moist yard. So on the right is the Hylaeus bee that I talked about that carries its pollen in the internal crop. That one is again, same thing on an oak leaf flea bane. So you can kind of, you know, oak leaf flea bane and frog fruit, if you know the plants, you know they're quite small flowers. So it should give you some scale of the fact that these bees are not very large. And the Hylaeus bee also really likes 
goldenrod. And I um, saw one, I've seen one every year, the last four years of my garden on the goldenrod, but I don't normally see them right away until I see another bee, uh, another bee moving around on it. And then I might happen to see the hylaea. So they're pretty small. They're um, not very afraid of people, at least the females when they're foraging. So you can get kind of close to them, at least on the goldenrod. When they're on things like fleabane, they tend to fly away a lot faster. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for these guys. And I mean, the serotina bees, they are just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, that color that they have. Um, and so they are looking to nest in the stems of plants. So these are two images of serotina bees from out in Minnesota, because I have not been lucky enough to have them or to find them nesting in my yard yet. I have them in my yard, but I haven't found nests. So Heather Holm took these two photos. And I mean, you can see the difference already between the size of a hollow tube of one of a, maybe a past wildflower, and then a, a little bit larger stem that you can see the, the butt of one of the serotinas inside the stem on the top image. And there's another one on the outside and they're working on excavating that. So you wanna be leaving habitat in your yard for the stem nesting bees. And so that means leaving um, dried out plants not cutting everything down at the end of the season. You know, I know we want to tidy our yards, but if you can leave any like hollow pithy stem um, plants, could be flowers, could be grasses. And if you can leave them for a couple of seasons, because it takes time, you know, the bees have to find these stems, they have to dry out, then they have to be able to create their nests, and then they have to go through that full brood cycle until their young emerge. So they need time. So, you know, some people say, well, I'll just cut it all in the spring. But really, if you can leave them a little bit longer, it's better. Um, if you need to cut them, you know, if you can leave 12 to 18 inches roughly is about the length that they, the researchers have said, you know, seems to be enough. Um, and if you have to cut them all the way down, you know, I understand people are in HOAs sometimes, they, they really have to be very careful then cut them all the way down. You can try bundling them and kind of keeping them in that area. But once again, I mean, we are not bees. We try to encourage bees to do the things that we humans want them to do, but you know, they wanna do what bees want to do. So in my garden, I try to leave stems. You know, I neaten up and I leave some, uh, cut a few. And then, you know, I, I do have my bee box, which I use more for images than anything else for taking photographs. Um, I, always prefer to encourage people to create habitat in their garden rather than having boxes which need to be cleaned um, and are actually you know, perfect for predators and parasites. So the more habitat you have, the more likely you are to have bees utilizing that habitat. Um, so some of the plants that the stem nesting bees like can be you know, lots of our wildflowers, bee balm, can be blazing stars, um, dune sunflower, uh, elderberry, goldenrod, Joe pieweed is great if you live in Northern Florida, the stems are hollow, very, very popular with stem nesting bees. Raspberry canes are also extremely popular. Swamp milkweeds, um, switchgrass is another possibility. You know, any of the grasses that have a hollow stem are always a good possibility for them. And then, you know, so just think about like, again, thinking about how can I think like a bee? What things can I do? Taking away the human part of it, and just realizing that you know we're creating habitats in our yards and in our natural areas. So we really want to encourage the bees that exist there who have evolved alongside all of these native plants and wildflowers. We want to be able to have them have homes in our gardens. With that, we have some other interesting ones. These are cavity nesting bees. So this is just, you know, again, lots of different kinds of bees. So these are just some of the ones I've found in my yards and in local areas. This trio of photos on the left was a mega Kylie species I found. I was standing in my yard, I was doing something and I see this flash of yellow out of my, my corner of my eye. And I was like, I'm always looking for things like that. So I was like, what is that? I turn around and I don't see anything. I don't see any flowers around either. So I'm standing there and I see, here comes a flash of yellow again, and it's, it's going through the air. So I figured it had to be a bee going through the air with a flower. And so it was this mega Kylie bee. She was going to the partridge pea flower. She was cutting the petals because some bees do like to line their nests with flower petals. Um, and she was cutting the flower petals and she was bringing them back to this 
you know, wildflower that most people would consider a weed. I don't remember what it's, but it's got little teeny tiny little daisy like flowers on it. Very weedy looking. It gets about three feet tall. I tend to leave them. And this um, spider, very tiny spider, had woven a spider's uh, web around kind of the circular shape around the inside of it, but it was open in between. And so she was bringing her partridge pea petals over to the plant, uh, over to the weed head, over through, you know, the weed is blowing in the wind and she's trying to avoid getting stuck in the spider web. And every time, whoop, straight down the top of the nest, down and, and avoiding the spider, who's really tiny compared to her, not bothering her. And she created her nest inside this dried up weed head. And it, you know, the third photo, you can see she's peeking out, she's getting ready to leave, and she's already been working on constructing her nest. And eventually she finished it. And there were three different tubes. And I have found um, a couple of other times I've found tubes around the sides of like a goldenrod plant, but it didn't survive. Maybe predators ate it. It was kind of out in the open, but here were these yellow tubes on the side of a plant. So really, you know, you might be thinking bees are here, but bees can be everywhere. Um, the one on the right, I was at the preserve and I saw a bee coming out of the bushes. And once again, always looking around and I couldn't figure out where she could be coming from. And then I found this nest nestled among the branches of a shrub. And you can, again, you can see there, there's petals on the inside of it. Maybe it was a hummingbird nest. Maybe she built it. I'm really not sure. I didn't get a great shot of her, but she was one of the, the megachylae species who built this nest or worked in this nest here in the bushes. So they're very enterprising. I mean, I've even found them going into holes in my concrete, in my driveway, going into the bottoms of um, the black plastic rower pots. You know, these guys are, are, are pretty creative when it comes to nests. Um, so these are some other ways that you might see them. This is a, a megachylae cutting the leaves to line her nest. You can see in the middle image, this is evidence of leaf cutter bee activity. I promise it won't kill your plant. They love beauty berry. They love um, cocoa, uh, cocoa plum. There's lots of different plants. And you might think you see chewing on the plant, um, you know, on your leaves, and you see these big chew marks. That's not going to be uh, a leaf cutter bee. The leaf cutter bees are going to do these beautifully, perfectly, you know, half circle geometric shapes. Because when they're cutting with their mandibles, they're wrapping that uh, uh, leaf in between their legs. And when they leave, it leaves this like half semicircle shape. So they do like also rose petals. Um, so they, you know, they're, they're pretty creative on what they want to see. And if you're standing around and you see, you know, leaf cutter activity on plants, you might actually get lucky enough to see some leaf cutter bees actually cutting the leaves. Um, on the right is a different species of bee, the, another one of those sexual dimorphism. The female is fully black, the male is brown and black. Um, it's called Megachylae um, Megachile zalipodes. And this was a little box I had on my windowsill because we were doing some euglossa, uh, non-native euglossa experiments for a researcher. And uh, uh, one of these bees decided that she liked it for creating her tubes. And so that one on the bottom was tubes that she was building out of her leaves. I got to make lots of cool videos and really watch her work. And when um, she was finished, the seal on the outside of that box looked like the one on the top. Now the one on the top was actually done in a tube, but she would seal it with a leaf, masticate with saliva and completely seal it up so it's perfectly closed. Uh, and that box on the bottom, incidentally, it's still there. It's now full to the top with multiple seasons of nest tubes. I've never disturbed it. They just seem to like these little boxes. I don't know if it's easier for them, but they also do like the tubes. Um, so that's another possibility. And here is another possibility for a nesting habitat. This is one of our uh, resin bees. It's an, an uh, endemic. Uh, this is again, the, the Dianthidium floridiense. Um, here, she's utilizing my nest box that I have. On the left, she's looking for all kinds of nesting material, pebbles, little bits and pieces of wood, um, whatever she can find. In the middle, she's carrying a seed pod going back to the nest tube. And the poor bee, it was like trying to get furniture into your house. She could not get it into the tube. She tried everything. She kept getting stuck on the front and she kept manipulating it until she finally turned it sideways enough that she was able to enter the tube with it continued to create her nest, 
And on the right is a completed nest. That's what it looks like. Little bits of sand, and you can see it's almost glassy looking, little bits of, of plant material, and that's completely sealed up now. So, you know, we have osmia bees here, we have anthidiums, um, or uh, dianthidiums. You know, they all utilize these different varying um, bits of material from the environment to construct their nest. So I'm gonna try to move along because I know we're getting late here. Um, some bees prefer to nest in rotting wood. Here's an Aga Chlora Pura that um, complements of Heather Home again. So if you have a snag in your yard or if you have some chunks of, of an old log you wanna leave, they may find beetle holes or you can even drill holes in the sides and sometimes the, the, the bees will find those and begin nesting in them. Um, but now wait a minute, now where are the male bees sleeping? Because we're talking about a lot of female bees here, but you know, there's male bees out there and they need a place to sleep. So here we come again with not cutting everything down in your gardens. Every single one of these bees is sleeping on either something that's already dead in the environment or in the case of the bottom rye is sleeping in beautyberry seeds. Um, these are our beautyberry berries, but on the top is a longhorn bee sleeping on a Biden's alba stem. He'll spend the night clasping him uh, to the stem. They would roost together in that bottom uh, image. That bee at the top will be roosting in these large groupings. I think the most ever counted is like 56 bees. Totally gentle. You know, they get on there about four o'clock in the afternoon. They start trying to jostle to find their spots to sleep in. And the next morning, everybody flies off. And I found them typically near a nest. So they want to be right there, ready. They've got food. They've got nesting females. And, you know, they'll geolocate to the exact same spot night after night after night. So these are, you know, dead Biden's alba that I decided to take some out of the environment and leave some of them. On the left is a little tiny anthidiellum resin bee. Um, they typically sleep one, maybe two in a little area. Same thing, geolocating to that same exact stem night after night. Um, so if I was to cut that down, they would find a new spot, but I wouldn't get to see their cool behavior. Um, the top right is a helictus bee. Again, remembering the helictus bees are very common in Florida. Um, these are males sleeping up in a, a dried out seed head. And then on the bottom was males that I found during the, one of the coldest months. I think it was like 40 degrees that day. I was gonna collect some beautyberry seeds and I took them in my hand. All of a sudden I feel something moving around. I must've warmed him up enough that he could get up and start moving. So I put him back into the seed heads, but um, you know, they need a place to sleep as well. All right, well, we're getting towards the end. So I'm just gonna talk a little tiny bit now about the needs for food and habitat in the garden. Um, no matter whether you've got bees that you're looking at for the winter, whether you've got bees you're looking at for the summer, all these seasons are interconnected. So when you're planting, planting in the winter, getting ready for spring, do a variety of plants. White, yellow, purple, blue are some of the most popular with the bees. Um, having a variety of flower shapes, flat flowers, um, tubular flowers, some bees like big landing pads on big flat flowers and they have short tongues and they can access, you know, aster type flowers. Others like bumblebees have a longer tongue and they can access a flower such as like a salvia. They don't need to land on a flat flower. Um, if you plant in groupings, the bees don't have to travel as far. A bumblebee might travel a mile, but if you have a tiny bee, they're not gonna travel more than maybe a hundred yards from their nest. So if you pr uh, provide the plants in groupings, the bees don't need to work as hard. Um, hosting a bee-friendly lawn, allowing those wildflowers to grow in your yard, maybe getting in some flowering ground covers like the, like the frog fruit or sunshine mimosa, uh, reducing the mowing of the grassy areas. There's lots of little tiny, what we would think of as weeds growing underneath the grass that provide food for tiny spring bees. So thinking about all of that, not using pesticides and herbicides, you know, herbicides, pesticides, they all soak into the ground. Those bees are in the ground, or you might have accidentally inadvertently sprayed some flowers. Those bees are foraging on that now. So we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, you know, early flowering plants on this third over, the Lassio glass and bees. That's a very tiny flower, very tiny bees, and they were working on collecting pollen from it. We don't see these bees until we start looking for them. And then um, planting late winter, early spring blooming plants is really helpful. So wildflowers, these are, this is just a very general list I put together. 
you know, where you live could be different. Your, your landscape could be different, dry, moist. You know, you have to take all those things into consideration. But these are general plants that I know are blooming through these months. Um, you know, blanket flower, which I know has been taken off some of the list, but a lot of people still have it in their yards. Blue-eyed grass, Coreopsis, uh, fleabane daisy, of course. The rosemary species, our Florida conradina species. Um, you know, if you look on the top right here, that's the southeastern blueberry bee on conradina grandiflora. They're flying in the cold months of the year. They look like little miniature bumblebees, but they buzz really fast. They fly fast from flower to flower to flower. They need food in the winter time. Um, you know, there's brown belted bumblebees coming to things like lupine. Stacey talked about there's going to be a lupine walk soon. Maybe you guys will get to see some of the different bee species that are coming to lupine. Um, narrow leaf silk grass, liar leaf sage, uh, spider wart, partridge pea, lupine again, um, no square stem, which will bloom in a lot of places all winter, bee balm, um, sunshine mimosa being a good ground cover that'll start blooming again as soon as it warms up just a tiny bit. Uh, white indigo for some of the nor northern people, if they're lucky enough to have that. Wild pennyroyal, which is blooming in my garden right now and will bloom all right through the winter in our local area. And of course, Biden's alba, you know, the one that everybody hates, but I've counted over 16 bees in my yard on it. And of course, the males are liking it to sleep on. So consider maybe a little tiny patch of Biden's alba. And let's see, then you can also still do some shrubs and trees and vines. So like blueberry species, Chapman senna, cocoa plum, um, coral bean, gray leaf tea bush, marl berries, yellow necklace pod, all those, you know, possible ones during the winter. Maple is a huge one for the early, um, early emerging bees, especially up north. Uh, and then vines like Carolina jessamine, which the blueberry bees also use that one. Um, and so, uh, and of course the blueberry bees love our blueberry species. So with that, I have gotten to the end. I just wanted to show a little bit of a few resources for you guys. I wrote an article last year or a year or so ago um, for Bay Soundings, um, Tampa Bay Soundings, which you can go. I think they've sent it out to everybody. Um, it gives a little more information about the different kinds of species you might find, the different families of bees in, uh, in Florida. Um, Heather Holmes' book that just came out last year, The Common Native Bees of the Eastern United States, is a laminated guide you can throw into your backpack and carry with you. And there's a few um, of my bee images for Florida are in that book as well, but it is a general Eastern U.S. book. Um, the Bees in Your Backyard is a great book by uh, Joe Wilson and Olivia Carroll. Um, of course, Stacy and Nancy's book, Native Plants for Florida Gardens, is a book you should have also in your repertoire because it's got lots of great opportunity or lots of great um, examples of, of uh, native uh, wildflowers in particular for your gardens. And then two books, which I love just because of the philosophy that's so different is Benjamin Voigt's A New Garden Ethic. Um, and then Doug Tallamy's Nature's Best Hope. They just are about shifting our philosophy of how we view our gardens. Um, websites, IFAS has some information on their Florida Native Bee page. Um, my iNaturalist project is of course, you can go to that. Like Stacy said, you can look in there, search around, see what bees are in your area. Please consider adding your observations. Um, the Bee Basics book by Beatrice Moisette, who recently passed away, unfortunately, you can search it as a Google book. It's still available free as a downloadable PDF. Um, Xerxes Society has wonderful bumblebee information and some other native bee information as well. But for bumblebees, they've got lots of information in there. Uh, Discover Life and Bug Guide are a little bit more for people who are going a little more in depth into the insects, but they're great resources as well. And of course, um, my Florida Native Bees Facebook group. And with that, we conclude. Thank you for listening to me talk about our native bees. Um, I bend everybody's ear all the time. I'm so glad that you guys would listen to my presentation about them as well. The bees say thank you as well. So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. And I managed to get it in before the hour is up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Laura. This has been really uh, incredibly informative and uh, just appreciate all the information that you have and the beautiful photos. Thank you so much. We do have um, just a couple questions if you can hang on for a couple yeah. minutes. Sure. Um, and just to, for everyone here still, the resources that Laura mentioned in her last slide, we will include those in the resource sheet that we'll uh, send out to you 
along with a link to the recording of this webinar when it is available. Um, let's see. We have a couple of questions about um, bee boxes or, or I'd say manufactured mm -hmm. bee homes. Um, do you recommend paper tubes or bamboo for nests? I mean, if you're going to, I never recommend bee boxes, first of all. They're always the, um, the last resort because I want to encourage people to have habitat. Um, a lot of people think if I just put a bee box up in my environment, the bees are going to come, but they, they skip over the fact that they need forage. And of course, we know that so many bees nest in the ground. But if you're going to get a bee box um, and have tubes in it, the paper tubes are um, one of the, the best ones because they do decompose. Um, and you can change them out, you know, re pretty readily. There are there are paper tubes that can go inside of bamboo tubes, but it's just more work. You have to make sure you clean them. You have to make sure you check on them. Um, but I, you know, I, I do like the boxes for learning experiences, and kids can learn and watch as well. But I had several species that live in those that one box I have, um, so I would definitely go towards the paper tubes if possible. Great. And then uh, Gail was asking if if she already has a bee box. Um, does it need to be taken down and cleaned or is it is it okay to leave it alone for several years? I mean, really, you should take it down and try to clean it out. I would do that in the winter. Um, you can always take out, you'll see the tubes that are still sealed. So you can always take those tubes out, set them aside and put them back in, but put in fresh tubes in the meantime. Um, but it, again, that's why this is one of the, the tough things with bee boxes. It does take more work with them. But, you know, cleaning them, like I said, look for the capped tubes take them out, clean out the whole box, replace the cap tubes, and then put in new straws along with them for the following season. Great. Um, you mentioned that bumblebees hibernate. Is that true throughout the state? Do they, specifically, the question was whether they hibernate in South Florida. They still hibernate. They still need that hibernation um, period. It may be shorter. I mean, I don't see bumblebees in my area until midsummer. And once they come out, they're out in full force. Whereas in other places, they're already out in early spring in other parts of the country. Um, so they do still need to um, spend some time hibernating. And what is, I know you mentioned this um, a little bit, but what's the general size of the, the bees territory? How far do they tend to feed from their nests? So, you know, what I've observed mainly in my yard is, first of all, the small bees, you're mainly looking at maybe, maybe 100 yards away from their nest if they're tiny. Um, bumblebees are foraging wherever they're going, a mile, two miles. Um, the rest of the bees that are, Habropoda laboriosa, which is the bumblebees, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the um, blueberry bees, they will forage I'm not sure how far they actually go. Um, we have one of the researchers in our group who's studying them, but I think they'll still go quite a bit of a distance because I know they don't have them nesting in my yard, but they definitely come to my yard. Um, so really, you know, a lot of the bees that are in my yard are probably foraging maybe a few hundred uh, yards away at the most. Um, so, you know, I would say average probably a few hundred yards for a lot of the different bee species. Great. And then I have a few questions there uh, talking about the environment that the ground nesters need. Um, and I'll kind of try to roll this into one, but if, do they need the drier sandy soils or can they tolerate the more oak hammock um, habitats and, and how do they tolerate the, the rainy season? Right. So they definitely prefer drier environments overall. Um, I think you will find them underneath Oaks, if there's open areas underneath high pines, there's open areas underneath, they can find those patches, but they're quite good at sealing the nests closed to help keep the water intrusion out. I've got a, a corner of my, um, my house where the water just pours off in buckets. And I've got nests coming, uh, you know, nests in those areas where it like literally eats into the soil. Um, excuse me, and those bees still nest in those areas. So I think that they're just really good at, you know, sealing up that nest. They can survive like that for a while. Um, now, if it's inundated for months and months, I think that's going to be a little bit different. But they're, they're, you know, they're able to survive quite a bit of inundation. But they definitely still prefer, you know, the drier areas because they want to be able to get down in that soil and be able to yeah. nest there. But, you know, areas that have oaks and things like that, you may get cavity nesting bees in those areas because then they've got, you know, 
broken, you know, wood that's fallen and, and starting to rot. So you may get different bee species in those areas. Great. And then uh, the last question is, uh, what is the size of the little box that the leafcutter bees uh, nest were in? Oh, those are little tiny. I think that the researchers got them from like Michael's or something. There may be two by three jewelry boxes and they, they the top pops off and they drilled a small hole in the front. Um, so I've got these, you know, non-native euglossa, the orchid bees that everybody sees hovering in front of all the tubular flowers. They, um, they were doing a, a study on them. And so they were for them because they do produce tiny little honey pots. They're in the same family as honeybees and bumblebees. Um, but they're, they're just these tiny little boxes. Um, I never intended to have any of the bees like that utilizing them. So I think they're about two by three, something like that. And maybe a couple of inches tall. They're not big at all. They're just sitting on my windowsills. Yeah, it's hard to tell from the photo. How, how yeah, tall? I know, I know. And I, I don't, same thing. I, I don't encourage usually too much of that. Um, I really I just, I use it. I want to show people what things look like, but, um, but I don't usually, you know, I don't make a, a big habit of encouraging people to do that. But, you know, if you want to show kids and things like that, it can be useful, but they're just little tiny, small. I think, you know, any craft store sells them two by three boxes with a little lid that pops off the top. Great. I can, I can actually send you, um, I think the bottom of one of them still has a, a label. I can always send it to you so that you can, you know, post it up. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's um, what we have time for today. Um, but again, this will be recorded and a link will be sent out to everyone who's registered along with resources that were covered in today's talk. Um, and I uh, just want to thank Laura for an amazing presentation and for giving us her time today. Thank you. You're very welcome. And um, for those of you that enjoyed this program and the other programs we offer, please consider becoming a member, making a donation, or getting that Florida State Wildflower License Plate. You can find all of that information and more on our website at flawildflowers.org. Thank you. Thank you.